Hello, and welcome to the First Issue Club comic book podcast. We're your weekly reading club. We're just like Sue Storm. We love a good read. We're the First Issue Club. We're talking about First Issue comics. Duh. <laughs> what did you think we were going to talk about? You stupid idiot. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, I'm going to click on this app and open this thing up and what do you expect? Um, we're delivering. We're delivering on ex- on the exact promise and mission statement of our title. And we're going to be doing it by covering each a couple first issues later in the podcast. Uh-huh. I read Morningstar on Mad Cave that I'm excited to talk about. And Vargas read... Uh- I read a couple. I got Local Man, I got The Goon, and I got Feral. Oh, and some Kickstarter books. Hey, um, we don't have our third co-host, Greg, with us today. And by standard club rules, he is now the lowest ranking (laughs) member of First Issue Club. So back at the bottom of the heap, Greg, and hopefully you'll work your way back up. (laughs) That's Um, right. But not anytime soon, I think. Uh, he has to earn our favor back by buying us chips and Oreos. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can come up with some sort of snack point system. <laughs> snack point system. I'm fine with that. Uh, the, okay. The SPS. Yeah. <laughs> FIC SPS. This is one of my favorite segments of the show coming up. The news. <laughs> Is there anything more invigorating than waking up to that news wire sound, taking a shower, and just rocking to um, knowing all of the bounty that another day on this blessed earth has given you, all the gossip and hearsay, and uh, fun new stories <laughs> abound across the internet blogs. Not a hint of sarcasm in that. (laughs) Total genuine. So Vargas and I have both come to the table with a notes app full of things to talk about. Do you want to just go back and forth until one of us runs out? I think you might have more news topics than I do. I've only got a couple, but yeah. I only have a couple too. Let's go back and forth. All right. Well, maybe it'll be a quick news segment. My first thing was the Thunderbolts asterisk. Oh, have you heard anything about this? Uh uh-uh, uh uh uh. So, Marvel fans, Thunderbolts movie is coming out, and a lot of people have been talking about it lately because it's not only one in production, but one of your most famous actors on earth, Florence Pugh, shared a little bit of behind the scenes footage. Uh-huh. And one of the things that's been making headlines, way more headlines than I think this news point deserved. <laughs> <laughs> but the title of the movie on the back of like the cast and director's chairs uh-huh. is Thunderbolts Asterix. Much oh. like you see in a comic book when there's like a footnote attached. Okay. And so a lot of people are speculating that there's some sort of subtitle or caveat to what Thunderbolts is that might differ from your typical thunderbolts story so like thunderbolts masters of evil or something <laughs> could be a great crossover well <laughs> an adherent to the original point of the thunderbolts <laughs> yeah that's right uh so i mean i don't know this is one of those things that people are just like wildly speculating on one of the first one of the big like fan theories i'm hearing right now is that it might not even contain Thunderbolt Ross, its namesake. Oh, sure. Yeah. Which is a character that I don't think has shown up in the Marvel movies for quite some time. Is that right? Um, Maybe I'm wrong. Did They're hard to all keep track of. Did um, did he show up in I'm not like, a, like a Captain America movie for a brief second? It feels I like he so. showed up yeah. as... Like, you know, they weren't like, hello, General Ross, but yeah. like, you know, he was like there and mm-hmm. interacting. The last major movie he was in was uh, Edward Norton's Hulk, Incredible Hulk. So long ago. So long ago, which is but, technically still MCU canon. Just 
to catch everybody up. Yeah, I know. Everyone says there hasn't been a Hulk movie. There just hasn't been a Hulk Mark Ruffalo movie. That is correct. Um, yeah, was that the first or second Marvel movie? It might have been the second one after Iron Man. Yeah. that If not the first. Yeah, I think that came out in like 2009 or something. Iron Man was 2008 or something. I remember like when they announced that Edward Norton Hulk movie. I was mm-hmm. like, they just did a Hulk movie. Yeah, Ang Lee's Hulk. Uh, that it, was, it wasn't that long after Ang Lee's Hulk. Um, Better than most people remember. Go I, watch Ang Lee's Hulk. You know what? I've heard that a couple times recently, that people say it has maybe aged better than people think. I walked out of it. You did? I hated it. I really? thought it was really bad. Yeah. You should give it a give it a revisit. That might be a fun Patreon episode, actually. Sure. The three I'll, of us sit down and watch Ang Lee's Hulk. I'll watch it for that. That sounds fun. And then we can watch uh, David Hasselhoff's Nick Fury movie. Oh, you know what I'd be interested in? If people would be, if people would like kind of uh, watch along episodes oh, that sure. are like, hey, you guys push play the same time we push play and we just kind of talk while we're watching a movie. Or if like, that's way too much to ask of people to like know. sit down and push a play button. It's like, you want to hear stuff, not be like sitting and watching something you're trying to multitask when you're podcasting at the uh i mean at the worst that could be a patreon.com slash first issue club a little little plug well asterix was one of my movie hits in excellent its, in its entirety i'm over to you i'm jazzed about the thunderbolts movie i could not be more excited about this should be good i i think a real coup in having casted florence Pugh before she became as immensely famous as she is now. Yeah. You just hope they, this is one of the things that they did with the X-Men first class movies was they happened to cast Jennifer Lawrence's mystique before she got immensely famous. And then she like won an Oscar and then they tried to like rework the movies to contain her much, much more because she was such a big celebrity. And I don't think it, it worked Yeah, that they were just like, well, take the stuff we were writing and just throw this character into it. Uh, yeah, they should have, they should have done that with Michael Fassbender's Magneto. <laughs> sure. That would have been way better. <laughs> you, you like a movie centered more around his character around Magneto. Okay. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Cause eventually, uh, Jennifer Lawrence was like, I'm not going to put on all that blue makeup for the whole movie again. You know, yeah, I don't. Right? Th- yeah. She was like, "I'm gonna be <laughs> looking like myself." <laughs> yeah, I don't think she ever intended to be in the movies as much as no. she ended up being in them. But she just got too famous for them to be like, like squander her role. Yeah, and I think the movie suffered because they forced. I agree. Too much into that. <laughs> I agree. All right, my first news hit. Uh, there's a new Joker book coming out. I'll call it an OGN. Uh, but it's called Joker the World. Do you remember when they did this with Batman a no, couple of years back? I don't. So they got artists or creators, I sh- I'll say, uh-huh. from 13 different countries okay. to all write st- stories about the Joker in relation to their country of origin. Okay. Right? So I'll I'll read the whatever, the, the text, right? The sampler text, because it gives you sure. kind of a better idea. All right, right? synopsis, yeah. <clears throat> What does the Joker do when on holiday in Spain? I don't know. (laughs) How has he inspired others to follow his footsteps, creating Joker duplicates in Germany and Turkey? How does a Joker in Cameroon find inspiration? Only the top writers and artists from each country can provide the answers in unique stories celebrating one of the most compelling characters in pop culture. Okay. I think it sounds really interesting. Yeah, that's kind of a fun idea. I like it when the big two publishers give small guys a chance to, to play in their world. Yeah. You know, creators that you otherwise would not be exposed to yeah. get spotlit in this book in particular, especially when it's like you get to play with the character and highlight the, the place that you're from. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. it would be really cool if there was like a Joker story, Joker in Kansas city. Right? I mean, that'd be neat, right? For sure. people from Kansas City. I'd buy it. Yeah, exactly. Call it Joker <laughs> 50 States. This is not a comic book, you said. It's a graphic novel. Yeah, I mean, it's like an OG. It's like a collective. Yeah, thing. it'll be 10 bucks or whatever. But it's, Oh, that's cheap. Yeah, it's out in September. Okay. 
So. All right, that's better than I thought. I was like, if this is like a big hardcover thing that's like forty dollars, no, no way, no. All right, I can stomach ten dollars. Well, there you go. You can buy it in September. All right, I wanted to talk about Bleeding Cool's big vague article. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. This is another thing. Have you seen it? <laughs> no. Well, maybe maybe there'll be more by the time like this weekend rolls around. Okay. But they wrote this article. And the, their summary of it had four bullet points, which okay. is like a thing Bleeding Cool does. It's like at the beginning of every article is like, here are four bullet points so you don't have to read the article that we just wrote. Oh, great. <laughs> so, so Google can digest it and yeah. spit it back to me. Major comic industry hires will reshape the direct market soon. Okay. Familiar faces in long-held roles are poised for exciting moves. Okay. No firings reported, but significant job changes are imminent. Okay. Eager comic book gossip anticipates impactful industry shakeups. And what do these fortune cookie inserts mean? We don't know. No, I mean that's why I said Bleeding Cool's big vague article. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean that's it. Just like gave you a lot more fluff surrounding this. It ultimately said there's really like they think this boils down to two really big announcements and they have a more formalized article written that is going through like editorial and legal to make sure they can report on it when they're supposed to report on it and not have it be too much hearsay. Oh, so they can link back to this vague article and be like, as Bleeding Cool reported so, last week. Yeah, so Bleeding Cool is reporting that they've got news to report. <laughs> I guess in hopes that they don't get scooped, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they just want us to know that they knew first. And then I guess Bleeding Cool has some sort of editorial standards. That they're not willing to report, okay? Like r- rumors that aren't official yet. I don't know, but I don't know what this means. It almost sounds like something is going to happen, like an editor in chief of one of the like larger publishers is going to like start a new publisher or change publishers or something like that. Jim Lee goes to Marvel. I mean, it could be something like that. Yeah, and. That's maybe I I don't know if it's anything less than something like that. Yeah, I'm gonna be like bleeding cool. Come on. Yeah. Why write this big, your your famous big vague article of 2024, uh, to give me like such minor news? Like it has to be something like Jim. Hey, Jim Lee's going back to Marvel or CB Sabolsky's going to DC or something yeah. like that. Okay, let's make something up right here right now off the top of my head. Okay, I already committed to Jim Lee Goes to Marvel. All right, Jim Lee Goes to Marvel, and Scott Snyder takes over as editor-in-chief of DC Comics. Okay. I like it. That'd be a good article. (laughs) That'd be a good article. We'd be be talking about it for a while. I think the the implications of a Jim Lee type going over to Marvel would be really interesting. And you could talk about, you know, I don't know. A lot of a lot of the image people, as much as you love independent comic books, a lot of the higher ups at Image had their glory days at Marvel, and maybe you know did super iconic stuff with those characters, and never necessarily found the same amount of success with their creator own stuff as they did with totally those big big sweeping things they did at marvel or dc totally so we'll Mar- see marvel buys image that spawn to crossover with x-men that would be wild <laughs> yeah a lot of people would be very angry i think i would be over the moon you would be over the moon yeah sure if one of the big two bought the largest independent publisher yeah and just started crossing everything over I don't think there's any way it could even happen because they don't own the yeah. no for sure not. the comp the company doesn't own the intellectual property the creators do correct yeah spawn crosses over with aliens which is crossing over with the Avengers make it happen if this news was that spawn's gonna cross over with something <laughs> Spawn's already crossed over with Batman. Yep, twice. 
Yeah. Three times. Three times. Thrice. All right. <clears throat> My next news hit. DC is reprinting a whole bunch of old Elseworlds books. Okay. Some of them for the first time since they were first published. All right. Um, this is to line up with the new Elseworlds launch. Um, oh, I, you know what? I saw the Gotham by Gaslight uh, kind of like facsimile that's coming out. Yeah. Well, so they're doing that, but they're doing like trades of these all whole bunch of other Elseworlds stuff. So okay. like three volumes of Batman Elseworlds, three volumes of Superman. They're doing Catwoman, Wonder Woman, Justice League, all in trade. Okay. Um, the highlight for me, I think it's Batman Volume 2, but it's Red Rain, Blood Mist, and no, Blood Hunt or whatever, and Red Mist. All the, the three Batman Dracula stories. Okay. All collected in one volume. Cool. Yeah. So I'll probably be picking that up. Right um, on. I know that Greg is our Elseworlds boy. He loves that stuff, so... Yeah, he He'll does. He'll probably be buying a bunch of that. DC's really good at doing Elseworld yep. comics. All right. Okay, I wanted to talk about the Cover Price Top 20. Oh, okay. If anyone doesn't know, Cover Price is this website that aggregates a lot of the sales across sites like eBay to tell you like what's what the trends are and what people are paying and when's a good time to like sell and buy certain comics, yada, yada. How much your ALF number one is worth. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so every week they do this thing where they're like, what are the movers and shakers? These are the comic books that are rising in value or selling enough to be like notable for the week. Okay. And the top 20 is extremely influenced by the nostalgia bomb. That was the release of X-Men 97. Oh, sure. So if you've got X-Men comics you want to part ways with, I think like the next month is probably the best time to do it. Okay. Well, let's hear it. <laughs> all right. So number one uh -huh. on all the comics that are like trending in, in sales is Magneto becoming Headmaster. Oh, which, that's 200. It's just issue 200. Yeah, yeah. I've got that. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Um. That's always been a comic that's been like kind of a nothing, a nothing burger. burger. Yeah, yep. I bought that in the dollar bin. Yeah, it's a, you can find it in dollar bins. Um, but obviously, you know, people are probably buying like near mint, very fine yeah. copies. But uh, wild to see that at number one. That was kind of the story point, I think, of the first episode yeah. of, yep. of X-Men 97. So That's the, the cover where he's like got, he's in chains, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good issue. Number two, uh -huh. Jubilee's first appearance. Oh, okay. Is that... Which I thought was interesting. This, I think Jubilee's first appearance, at least for like the past 10 years, has been one of the most affordable, attainable first appearances of like a pretty major X-Men character. Is that in the Jim Lee run? Did he introduce, you know, like after the X-Men number one? I don't know. I feel like it was in the 200 somewhere. Oh, okay. So it was original run. Yes. Unc it was an uncanny. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it happens in uncanny X-Men. Okay. Um I don't know what that's selling for, but that's sure. Another one maybe time to sell it if you have it and you and you sell comics. Um skipping number 3. I think number 3 was probably Ultimate it, Amazing Spider-Man. Oh sure. Um number 4 was Mr. Sinister's first appearance. Oh, yeah. Okay. And number five is Mr. Sinister's first cameo. Sure. So a lot yep, of Sinister stuff. You. Yeah, because he was like the big bad of the X-Men 97 original series. Yes, yeah. that's right. So I think a lot of people are just in their feels. Sure. Wanting to get back to all that stuff. <laughs> totally. Number 16. Uh-huh. Omega Red's first appearance. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Which is a book that sometimes in like slabbed in a nine six sells for more than Jubilee's first appearance yeah. slabbed in a nine six. That is takes like me back to my so childhood. wild. Um, <laughs> I love that. So I think you know, grab that maybe after this hype dies down, grab that Jubilee first appearance, and then this one's really interesting. I okay. think number seventeen is Gambit's first cameo appearance okay which is x-men annual 14 now sure i think this might you might be saying why gambit's first cameo appearance and not gambit's first appearance uh -huh. there has kind of been a sea change in what people think is gambit's first appearance 
oh, is this like unnamed mutant shows up in the shadows and that's, then it's kind of retcon to be Gambit. So that's normally more along the lines of what a cameo is. Uh-huh. This in X-Men Annual 14, uh, Gambit shows up in 15 panels and is called by his name. How is that a cameo? That's what a lot of comic fans argue. So for a long time, you've had a lot of people spending a lot of money on Uncanny 266. Yeah. Which I think is just considered his first appearance because it came out like a week or two later and he's on the cover of it. Oh, sure. So it's like the first time people would associate a book with people are like oh new big character here and he just got associated with that his actual first appearance probably should be x-men annual 14 which has normally been the more affordable and cheaper books of the two but based on this and 266 not being in the top 20 we might finally be making kind of like a change in mentality based yeah. on how we define first appearances now that some of these older books that are like finicky and on the line are are going to start being a little more legitimately taken as actual first appearances. So well, glad I scooped mine up already. There you go, mon ami. <laughs> and cool. that's all I had. Okay. News wise. I got I got two more. We won't keep you that much longer for news, boys. Uh, This I thought was pretty interesting. So Brian Hitch Mm -hmm. of Ghost Machine fame, writing Red Coat, coming out soon. Uh, He recently revealed that DC rejected his proposal last year Mm -hmm. to do a new authority book. Okay. And so he said, okay, well, I'm going to go do Red Coat on Ghost Machine instead. Okay, so that's... Is Red Coat like his ver- independent version of Authority? No. Okay, no. It's, it's just like, I'm going to start another project because yeah, you won't let me do that. Because you won't let me do Authority. Okay. Um, This fucking blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Because that is... I mean, Authority was like... Ha- led directly to the Ultimates, which led directly to stuff like The Boys. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like... Mm-hmm. I can't believe DC would reject an, uh, the original creator of that series to come back and do it again. I think super f- fans of comics are familiar with that. Not most people. Okay, so the perfect opportunity to re- introduce an entirely new generation to this groundbreaking team of characters. Yeah, maybe. I just don't know if I see the authority by Brian Hitch on the shelf at a comic shop that I expect people to be, like, really excited about it. If you teamed him with Tom Taylor, who's currently writing, or... or Yeah. Somebody, right? Give him somebody as a writing partner and have him do the art. Yeah. How does that not blow up? Yeah. Right? Maybe. You, you, you seem don't you don't seem sold. I don't seem. I think if I'm a DC exec and I'm looking at the plate of what comics I can release next year, uh-huh. and I'm like, do I want? Am I better off with another Batman title or relaunching the Authority? I think I'm like, man, it's hard to just not do another Batman title. Even though it's like, yeah, there's a lot of Batman titles, but I think that's what people are going to buy. That's a shame, I'll say. Yeah. It's, I'm not Yeah, I'm not saying it's right. I mean, it's a shame to not give him six or 12 issues. Yeah. To, like, do something. Yeah. I think some re-education would be needed for a lot of your modern fans. Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah. I mean, you're probably right. It just it, it might mean like re release like re releasing some of the original stuff to yeah. get people's like get people excited about it and reinform people who didn't know much. Yeah. All that stuff. I think it I mean I guess mostly I was excited by the idea or would be excited by the idea of having a fresh start at these characters without the association of Warren Ellis. 
Oh, who, who okay. Originally, like, yeah. wrote, um, you know, if you could get mm-hmm. so another superstar writer on DC, yeah, to write, you know, plus I think that's another reason maybe they didn't want to touch it. Maybe, maybe, yeah. But it, again, it just ultimately seems... some of that money ends back up in his pocket. Oh yeah, that might be true. That might be true. Yeah. Um, but if it... you don't know, he's kind of been at the center of some. Yeah allegations controversy fill in the blank he got hashtag canceled a while back but um i don't know the details of his cancellation but google it i'm sure it ain't great yeah (laughs) but it it would be great to be able to take some of that stuff like back into the fold with the blessing of one of the original creators yeah sure and excluding the guy we don't like yep i had forgotten that part of it yeah so anyway I I guess I guess it's less of a a bombshell. <laughs> I thought it was. Um and then the last one is is more of a fun thing, but um James Gunn uh hosted a table reading for the new uh Superman movie, right? Oh, cool, okay. They're, you know, starting to kick up production of that and he invited uh Jerry Siegel's grandsons wow, okay. to the table reading. Very cool. They gifted him a reprint copy of Action One signed by Jerry Siegel. Whoa. How cool is that? That's neat. Yeah. Wow. He posted a picture of it, you know, on his Instagram. Can't be many of those. I know, right? Uh, but they they had, you know, the two grandsons with James Gunn, and he's like holding this book, and it's Action One. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, did they give him an action one? And then it's like, oh, reprint copy, but yeah. signed by the yeah, creator of Superman. Signed. That's cool. Yeah. When did he pass away, I wonder? I don't know, because it feels like it was like the 90s, because he was yeah. kind of a recluse. Yep. You know, un- unfortunately, a lot of these famous old school comic creators kind of die in relative obscurity. Yeah. Uh, born 1996, he died. Yeah, see? There you go. So he lived long enough to have signed a, some probably reprint copies. Many, <laughs> a, many a copy, I'm sure. And probably on the cover, too. Did you, Hopefully, Could you yes. see if the signature was on the cover? I, I didn't look that closely. If, any, if anyone does, back, like in the 80s, if you went to, and if you met a comic book creator and had them sign a comic... They'd normally open up to the first page and sign by in, their name, right? But yeah, kind of by their name on the first page or in like the margin of that by the, I don't know, whatever the legal and yeah. print date stuff is called. And it's like indicia or yeah. something like that. Which is a real like. Know, it's just a publishing term that I'm not familiar with. That's like a book writer thing. Yeah. That's what writers, all, you know, you don't yeah. sign the cover of a book. Exactly you right. You sign the inside. Yes, exactly right. Get your head out of your ass as comic writers. <laughs> Sign my cover. You know? <laughs> You're not that guy. Guy. Yep. <laughs> That's all the news I had. All right. Some fun stuff. Some serious stuff. Some stuff that I thought was going to be serious, but wasn't. <laughs> so, that's fun. All right. What did we read this week? Yes. You want to talk about your Mad Cave book, or you want me yeah. to go first? I'll, I'll, right. get, I'll get my Mad Cave book out of the way. Morning Star. Okay was released this past Wednesday as of recording. And it is about a team of fire jumpers who get trapped in a fire, pass away. Okay. And one of the families of one of the fire jumpers goes back to this forest to spread their father's ashes because it was like one of his favorite places. Okay. There are some things that happen in this comic that are like uh, sci-fi, creepy, scary phenomena. Okay. Yeah, yeah, That I had a hard time like making sense of. It looked like there were like a bunch of people that kind of froze in place. Okay. Sure. And weren't able to move. And then later on, we've got this guy's son of one of the deceased firefighters. Uh Uh-huh. Um who kind of lives in his own head a lot and makes up his own fantasy stories. And so we've been seeing kind of some of his like imagination throughout the course of the comic. And in the last page of the issue, 
we're not quite sure whether or not the thing he's seeing is in his head or if it's maybe some freaky phenomena sure. from the forest. And, you know, does is bringing his father's ashes back, spurring that? Is it just some feelings that are being brought up yeah. and that's spurring it? But in any case, what we've kind of found ourselves in situationally is this family out in the forest, you know, out of range of reception, trying to have this like intimate family moment and get away. And they might have to face some freaky deaky stuff. Yeah. So, so the wooey I mean, wooey stuff is like the metaphor for their feelings. Sure. I think so. <laughs> sure. I, uh, I enjoyed it. It was a quick, easy, breezy read, and it was two ninety nine. dollars Hell yeah. Hard to beat. Yeah. So pick it. I mean, if you're into independent comics and you're at the shop and see this, I can give it a shot if that quick synopsis sounded interesting to you. Like, it, it read nice, sweet, and easy, and I'm intrigued by um, where it could go from here. I didn't get from the synopsis. You know, sometimes it tells you if it's like one out of four. Yeah. Or whatever. I don't know how long of a series it is, um, but I don't believe it's an ongoing. So probably self-contained, fun indie book that uh, is going to get a little like eerie and spooky. I love that stuff. Yeah. I. Th- and that's one of the joys of indie publishers, right? Mm-hmm. Is you get four issues to do your thing, whatever yeah. your thing is. And they tell small stories with like families and stuff, and yeah. you can always relate to like the family dynamic in that there's some interesting it's poised to have some like industry interesting commentary on grief and you know disappearing into your imagination when you're confronted with something you don't want to face yeah yeah disassociating yeah there's there's just some really interesting themes in there and you know depending on where it goes um could be really cool Worst case scenario, it's like a uh, interesting sci-fi comic. So I say sure. give it a sh- I say give it a shot. Totally. I thought it was cool. Awesome. Yeah. I love that. That's the best kind of best kind of story, I think. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, this seems interesting enough. Yeah. And when the first issue pays off, it's just icing on the cake. Yeah, right on. Um I read uh, no big two books this week from either of us. Yeah, so the big two books that came out that we're kind of not talking about are um, Batman... Batman Dark Age. Dark Age. Uh Uh-huh. There was a Mary Jane Black Cat first issue. Yes. That was, I think, is technically Jackpot Black Cat, which Jackpot is Mary Jane's hero alter ego now, which is kind of a newer thing as of the last year or so. Yes. Um, Those comics are traditionally fun. I think this is like the third volume of their book together. Is Jed McKay writing it though? He's I a busy boy right now. Yeah, he wrote the last couple yeah. and they were great. Yeah. So hopefully this next one's going to be good too. But, but we didn't read any of those. Yeah, we're focusing on the indies. <laughs> so I read, I'll, I'll start with kind of the the annual. This is kind of a first issue, but kind of not. So I read Local Man Bad Girls. Um, this is their... Ooh la la. I know, right? So pretty spicy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, between issue nine and issue 10 out in May, they released this little uh, annual size book. And the cool part about these annuals that local man is doing is they're, um, they're still expanding the story of local man Mm -hmm. without dealing with cross Jack specifically. Okay. Right. So the, I don't, I haven't read local man. Oh, uh, uh, you're killing me. Is Cross Jack the main character? He he is local man. Okay. Um. So yeah, like the the numbered issues are his story. Okay. Right? Uh, this issue gives us some backstory on Neon, who's on the cover, mm-hmm. and his Cross Jack's uh, love interest from the main story. So okay. she is Neon is his past, and. The other girl is basically his present, okay. right? And without giving much of the story away, they're basically telling stories to each other um, while talking about Crossjack. So, okay, you get 
you get the local man thing where you get the the art of the current day yeah. you know that's very like typical and then you have the flashback scene and it goes back into the 90s art style um and then it goes back to the you know present day and then it goes back to the 90s art style so um if you are reading local man this is absolutely you have to pick this up okay just like uh local man gold if you missed that go pick it up uh if you're not reading local man you're going to be lost. You're going to be you're going to be totally lost. Okay. Um but again, Local Man remains one of my like absolute as soon as it comes out, it's the first on my to read pile. So this book is incredible. Is this based on characters that actually existed in the 90s in Image Comics? That's the cool part. Is all the all the orig- the characters in Local Man are OCs. But they okay. they interact with OC is short is nerd for original character. Uh, my OC, yes, cor- yeah. that's correct. Um, but they interact with '90s image characters. Okay, to give the as you were flipping through it, I saw Witchblade. And correct, I was like oh, that's funny. And the, in Local Man Gold, they interact with like Savage Dragon and okay. Shadow Hawk and all of these like got it guys. So it gives it. They existed then. We didn't have a comic book. Yeah. about their exploits during the 90s yeah exactly okay. it, it, it gives <laughs> it gives it like the facade uh, yeah. that this is like a, a a retcon that's fun yeah and so this so local man is set in the present day yes but he, de- but dealing with a lot of their history yeah co- throughout throughout the normal run not just this comic correct that's kind of what I'm asking correct because because okay. local man is a imagine if a member of young blood was kicked off of young blood and forced to go live in his hometown yeah um he's like gets a normal job gets a normal job but then has to solve a murder mystery in his hometown okay so you get that sounds cool that's local man yeah. in a nutshell. Um, the two trades are coming out in April. Volume one in stores now. Volume two, April 3rd. So I would 100% recommend reading Local Man. It's incredible. Uh, Tim Seeley is going to be at C2E2. Right on. So good stuff. Um, again, don't pick it up if you're not reading Local Man, but go read Local Man. <laughs> Speaking of spicy comics. Yeah. I think I'd blush too much to buy that at the comic shop without knowing that it was a comic that I'd already like. Okay. Um, I watched a distillery uh, webinar yesterday. Oh, okay. That was Becky Cloonan and Tula Lote, Lote uh-huh. Uh-huh. talking about the release of Somna 3. Ooh. And they just answered a bunch of questions that like fans had about the release. And it was really cool because it was like they just did like a happy hour. Uh-huh. And so it was mostly Tula and Becky just kind of like chatting like they normally would, paying each other compliments, talking about the inception of the story and what they were excited about it. And they did get a little, I had to hop off of it um, before it ended, but they did get a little into like the trend of sex positivity in comics and how a lot of people are writing like sexy horror sure. in comics right now. Uh-huh. And it's not totally done in like a final girl traditional way. It's a little yeah. more like female empowering. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a lot more fantasy fulfillment sort of comics for women. Yes. Especially sure. recently. Yeah. And I don't know. It was just cool. When I think sex positivity in comics, I think like Becky Cloonan and Tula Lote are kind of modern all stars. Sure. That, well, and, <laughs> in that realm with and like Mirka and Dolfo, yeah. especially too. I don't know that they would consider themselves that, but I think they're kind of, they've been some like leaders in that in that trend, whether they realize it or not. So for sure. It's just, just cool. Well, and to that point, I'll say Tim Seeley, one of the writers of local man is yeah. also very much. Yes. Sex positive and female empowerment. And, um, we talked about, uh, hack slash on our last, last Patreon episode, yeah. another Tim Seeley book. Um, we talked about sacred lamb. I know at one point, yep. another Tim Seeley book. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's that does an interesting thing with the final girl trope, and uh, it's like a commentary yeah. on it. Exactly, and yeah. that's kind of Tim Seeley's whole bit. Is yeah. like he does he does that hypersexualized women thing, but with a point, with a purpose. Yeah, with a with a a twist or a you know commentary. Yep. Anyway, all right. Uh, next book I read uh, was The Goon, Them That Don't Stay Dead by Eric Powell. Hey. Um, this was my first Goon comic. Wow, okay. Uh, and I loved it. Um, I'm a big Eric Powell fan from... Um, did you hear what Eddie Gein done? Oh, I know that title. I didn't associate it with Eric Powell, to yeah, be honest. Yeah, he did the art with okay. Harold Schechter, and it's like a true crime book about yeah. Ed Gein. Um, obviously, this is not that, but the art in here is, I mean, just impeccable. Mm-hmm. I, Eric Powell's art is absolutely incredible. Um, and it's a very fun story to boot. So the the goon and his buddy whose name they met definitely say in the book but i can't think of Mm -hmm. um get caught up in a i'll say a noir and i don't know i assume that that's typical for the goon yeah based on the art style um but you know there's kind of a femme fatale ish character who shows up and uh has something that these vampires want and she (laughs) you know, bumps into the goon uh, and ends up giving them the thing that the vampires want. So now that they are, you know, entrusted with this thing, they have to figure out what it is and why they want it and who they need to get it to, that kind of thing. All right. A lot of fun. Nice, easy, breezy read. This one's one of four. One of four. Um, It is in black and white. So I guess if that bothers you, you know, it shouldn't, but skip it. But <laughs> it was really good. Uh, I can see why this is a character that people really attach on to. It reads very much like an old school comic mm-hmm. from the 40s, 50s, 60s, where there's a lot of uh, uh, text boxes that kind of tell you what the characters are thinking mm-hmm. um, instead of them saying it, which is more you know how we're used to reading. Yep. So... Um, that sort of thing was a roadblock for me for a while with, I don't like reading books like that. Yeah. Um, but you kind of have to shift your gears in your head to, to get over that, that, that it's, it's more of like watching a neo-noir movie where the, the protagonist is doing a voiceover. Yeah. Yeah, Right. Um, these are the sort of comics that I have a hard time deciding whether or not to recommend them to people because your the story may be really good and your sensibilities may really lie in kind of the genre or tone of the comic, but due to some formatting things, it just might be tough as someone's like first, second, third comic book. If you're not like super versed in for sure how to how to read comics and how to absorb the information. Yeah. If you're if you're new to comics as a format, yeah. This is probably not the book for you. Yeah. If you're interested in neo noir books or a more classic comic book read, mm-hmm. or if you've like tried to read old Spider-Man books and had a hard time doing it, this might be a good way to get onto it. Sure. Because it still has modern sensibilities. It still has a lot of like humor, mm-hmm. and, you know, and it, it is a modern book. Um, but but it, done in the classic style. Done in the classic style. That's yeah. exactly right. So Eric Powell, Eric Powell, one of the, the masters of the craft. Yep. Does it again. Right on. Um, and the last book I read is Feral, which is from the creative team of Stray Dogs. So they this... had to come back and do another one. I'm almost surprised it took this long. Yeah. <laughs> Stray Dogs is like such a big hit. Yeah. So this should fire on all of your like speculator radar. Yeah. Um, but this has basically the same art style where it looks like a, a Disney movie. Um, but this time it's cats instead of dogs in a world where 
I'll speculate a little bit as mm-hmm. the story because they didn't reveal any of this. But my guess is there's a, a strain of rabies that causes zombies <laughs> because the first issue is basically just that these cats in a uh, animal control van that crashes mm-hmm. and then some like feral foxes attack them. Okay. And the two cats are looking for their other like brother cat and eventually find him. And then they have to like get themselves home. That's, yeah. that's the story. So it's, homeward bound with zombies is, All right. is my guess yeah uh this genre really seems to be taking off lately the the like animals in a weird setting genre yeah you know obviously just doing something heavy with cute characters design yeah kind of what you're saying yeah, yeah. well that animal I've... animal centric stories yeah yeah um Obviously, Stray Dogs was kind of like the impetus of this, but stuff like Animal Pound and Man's Best we talked about last week. Sure. Feral, um, that kind of stuff. Yeah, the cutesy, beneath the trees even, right? Mm -hmm. The cutesy art style with the, uh, I'll say sinister undertones or overtones, (laughs) as the case may be. But it's a very fun read. Um, I have not read Stray Dogs, but this book made me... Was it was so good? I was like, I have to go read Stray Dogs now. Um, yeah, I thought Stray Dogs was like, I kind of rolled my eyes at it because it's like, oh, they did another movie homage cover. Oh, they did yeah. a, you know, Army of Darkness cover. But... There was a bit of a stigma surrounding Stray Dogs because part of the art style, I feel, leans into. A little bit of the furry community sensibilities. Sure. Which is like very heavy in like fan art of doing like dogs that kind of feel humanistic. Sure. Or not just dogs, but like random characters. And then those things can tend to be like a little sex charged. Yeah. Not that like Stray Dogs was that exactly. I think it tried to lean a little more into the... Um, 101 Dalmatians kind of look of things. Yeah. But at the same time, some of the character stylings just have that vibe I, that I'll say that furry fan art has. <laughs> I'll say, though, that that's not, that's not, I don't think, I think that's the creative team trying to lean into the Disney thing. Yeah. That happened to be co-opted by yes. this other fandom. Sure. Because not that the, I, not that there's anything wrong with any of it. Yeah, we're doing this for sure. Seinfeld line. Um, <laughs> yeah, I say yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not not trying to kink shame or anything, but it was just uh, an understanding the mythos of stray dogs and it's like huge rise to popularity out of nowhere. Yeah, I think had something to do with a little bit of that fan base just like falling in love with the covers. Sure. Yeah. I could totally buy that. Yep. Um yeah, so the, the 101 Dalmatians thing is e- e- exactly what I like thought of. Yeah. Or like Fox and the Hound. Mm-hmm. That kind of classic Disney style. And I can totally see how as soon as you start putting those characters in movie homage covers uh that people would be drawn to that. Yep. Which I guess, whatever. If something resonates with you, pursue it. Yep. If it's safe and not hurting other people, have a great fucking time. And also go read what plastic clear vinyl. (laughs) Okay. So someone did do a series of three books. Yeah. Each one was a different material. Yeah. One was vinyl. One was plastic. I don't know what the other one was. Velvet. Felt. (laughs) I think they're all artificial feeling. Polyester. Like stuff like that. Windbreaker. Uh, Was that that this team? No, it was not. Okay. But didn't they do... Wasn't their last one related to the furry community? Where somebody like witnesses a murder... I don't recall. If Greg was here, he would know, because I think he was the one that talked uh, about it. The character in Vinyl, who's a murderer, puts on a mascot head, I think. 
mm. a bear mascot head when he kills people. Okay. But it feels like a demented Chuck E. Cheese uh, and yeah, less yeah, yeah. like yeah. a furry coated thing. All right. Well, I'm, I guess, off base. Yeah. Well, definitely. <laughs> How dare you? I'm sorry. I'm failing everyone. Uh, yeah. So that's everything I read. Right on. We've done it again. Successfully navigated another week of first issues on your shelves. Hopefully that pick, helps you pick out what to buy, what to save your pennies on, and we'll be back next week to do it all over again. Check us out on, what, Instagram, YouTube, X? Are we on Blue Sky? <laughs> no. Is Blue Sky kind of the new yeah, Twitter? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. Patreon.com slash First Issue Club. Join our Discord and... Uh, at me about how wrong I was about everything in this episode. <laughs> I'm always out to learn about why I'm wrong. Ta-ta for now. <laughs> <laughs>